the Advanced Tech Podcast, providing a spotlight for innovators and disruptors. For links and show notes, and to find out how to sponsor the Advanced Tech Podcast, go to advancedtechmedia.org. You can also find and sponsor us on Patreon. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a rating. You can also sponsor us using Bitcoin at advancedtechmedia.org slash sponsor. Welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today is Rodolfo, aka NBK, CEO of CoinKite. Welcome, Rodolfo. Thanks for having me. You bet. So for our listeners that don't know much about you, could you give us a brief intro? So I run uh, CoinKite and uh, we make uh, hardware... Bitcoin hardware devices. Not much more than that, I guess. <laughs> it's enough to keep the day busy. Cool. So again, for listeners that aren't familiar, um, or maybe are, if you could give us highlights about Open Dime, Cold Card, and the Block Clock. So we have four main products that we make to enable people to do Bitcoin securely and privately. Open Dime is a Bitcoin bearer bond. It's essentially a physical Bitcoin where is trust minimized so that you can physically exchange Bitcoin uh, without any trace or need to wait for confirmation. Uh, it's a fairly private uh, system for exchange of Bitcoin. Uh, we make Code Card. Code Card is arguably, I guess, uh, one of the most secure uh, Bitcoin wallets in the market. It has a, a pedigree in privacy and uh, and it's air gapped. Uh, it's it's uh, designed for cold storage. Uh, so people that uh, need to hold Bitcoin, uh, especially large amounts of Bitcoin, uh, choose that. We created a Block Clock, our other product, uh, last year as a 10-year anniversary of Bitcoin. It's just sort of like a very expensive piece of art that uh, shows uh, Bitcoin uh, information. And uh, we just launched uh, Cold Power, which is a little uh, tiny cheap device that helps you have uh, essentially data isolation for USB power for your cold card. And uh, we have more things coming up soon uh, in our roster of products. Awesome. Um, did you want to talk about Terminal or Bitcoin Server? Those were products we had way back then. Uh, so we had our foray into uh, Bitcoin way back in the day by making the first Bitcoin debit card and Bitcoin debit machines. And uh, for that, we made a Bitcoin secure server so that we could run the backend for all that. Uh, those products have been sort of shelved for years now. So one thing that's on everybody's minds is the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So how are you coping? Um, it's kind of funny, but uh, I, I work from home. Uh, my team works from home and uh, we have a factory here in Toronto and those guys are now staggered. But for me personally, aside from uh, more childcare, surprisingly, like not too much of a change. Uh, you know, I still go out for walks and uh, bike rides. I can't go to the shooting range because it's uh, closed. But, you know, my habits of online shopping are still the same. So, yeah, it's, it's not too bad. How about you? So I live in Vancouver. Um, I think we had a protest here <laughs> a couple right. days ago. So uh, like Vancouverites have kind of a, we're kind of in a soft quarantine, if you will. So it's strongly suggested that you stay home, uh, but it's not mandatory. So if you do decide to go out, then you're expected to keep, you know, the two meter distance, the social distancing protocol. So I think for the most part, people are very respectful of that. You did see some of the footage, uh, I think about three weeks ago, where our prime minister kind of ad admonished us. That guy is insufferable. <laughs> I tend not to um, to comment too, too much on politics, but I do find it a little off-putting that he's kind of leading by, you know, do what I say versus do what I do. I believe he was at a cottage this past weekend and there was some travel happening within the government. I'm sure it's all deemed essential, but it is difficult, I think, for people that have been under, you know, full voluntary quarantine to see people traveling and moving around uh, unrestricted. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like a classic dilemma, right? Like politicians are all trash, um, <laughs> all sides. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, I, I totally saw that, you know, our insufferable prime minister decided to enjoy uh, Eastern with his family while telling everybody else not to do so. And then I guess trying to chastise the opposition for going to work, which is uh, kind of uh, weird. Well, I mean, double standards. I think the the more people 
kind of live their lives according to a double standard, the less they're usually taken seriously. And for sure. Um, so let's dig into your Bitcoin origin story. What drew you into Bitcoin and why? A friend, which is now my business partner, he pointed me to the slash dot article way back then. And that post was the post to the Satoshi uh, paper. You know, it was very interesting. Uh, like many, I thought it, it wouldn't take off, but sort of started looking more and more into it at that time. And then, you know, felt like it was a pretty, pretty cool thing. And then I sort of tried using it and it was quite fascinating that it was actually working. And we built btclook.com, which was sort of like a, like a blockchain explorer just to sort of learn about Bitcoin. Best way of learning about something is building something for it, I find. And then it's been many years of building things for Bitcoin. It's uh, hard to get out of it once you're in it. There's uh, there's always so much to learn and there's always so much more to do. I've always been really impressed from the very beginning how, how much engineering is put into Bitcoin and how much product development. I think we're going to see a whole lot more uh, and really take a lot of industries by surprise in the next year or two. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's never boring, right? <laughs> there's always something <laughs> new and exciting or tragic happening in Bitcoin, which is very, very entertaining. What's your favorite tragic Bitcoin story? Well, I mean, you know, when it's almost like a, a, a Greek tragedy was the Mt. Gox. I mean, that was uh, Silk Road. I mean, I guess Silk Road was even better, but uh, the proportion of Mt. Gox was even more interesting, I guess. You know, it was classic drama and spin and, you know, the twist and the uh, uh, Ver claiming that the funds were in the bank and it was just, it was all there. I mean, every single part of the drama you want in a proper tragedy were, were there, except for death. As far as I know, there weren't any, but, uh, you know, and then, um, we had the price crash as a result of the, the Mongox tragedy that sort of taught a lesson to a lot of people who had not been around for the previous crashes. Uh, there were quite a few before. I think the best one was uh, from 230 down to, I can't remember, a couple dollars. No, it was down to $30. There was the $30 down to a few cents. It's interesting because we always have sort of like a, not a reason, but a catalyst that sort of like, it's always like the last drop in the bucket that makes Bitcoin cascade down. And then uh, many people capitulate and then people buy the dip and then the price go up again. It's quite of a fascinating cycle. I think it's unique on like, I mean, if you look at any new product or project, there's sort of that, that curve where you see like a little bit of adoption and then you see more broad adoption and then finally it comes down. But it's interesting to see how Bitcoin is almost almost immune to that, it seems. Satoshi fixed the problem with the number go up system, right? It's essentially a naturally occurring Ponzi. So every actor in the system is incentivized to both shield and retain their coins, right? So that uh, more people adopt, the price go up. And if the price go up, more people adopt. It's a very self-fulfilling system. And it's a very successful way of making a system getting more adoption, right? You play on the, the human FOMO, you know, in the VC space, they all know that, right? The, the easiest way to get more VC money is by having VC money. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you create a, a self-fulfilling system there. And uh, yeah, Satoshi played on that. And because it's so decentralized, nobody can prevent you from buying it either. Which is a, it's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, there's some bigger aspects of game theory definitely at play that I find very interesting. You know, it incentivizes, um, you can attack the network, but I think we've kind of proven, well, okay. So, I mean, if you look at something like Bcash and you see like right now you can attack the network for not very much money at all, whereas Bitcoin is quite different. And I think a lot of that has to do with the proof of work backing it. Um, if you were to try to 51% attack the network because it's so distributed and because there's so much power I guess, behind it. It really is a, a stopgap preventing that. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny because the 51% attack, it's theoretically possible, but not practical at 51%. So it's completely used as a straw man. In reality, you would need much more than 51% because you're going to need to reorg blocks. And you also are going to need the whole system to go with you. So all the economical nodes may not follow your chain, even if you do a reorg and you have 51% of the hash rate. So it's not as simple as simply having hash rate. It's an interesting thing. I mean, you could definitely cause a lot of pain and suffering 
and you can sort of like have the whole system sort of like bogged down because people won't know which chain to follow. But I'm still very skeptical that 51% attacks are even possible on a system as distributed as Bitcoin is. You have simply too many economical uh, nodes on the network that will keep even the hash rate war honest. So that's an interesting part. I mean, Big Cash is a whole different uh, bag of stupid. It, you know, the actors left in that system are not are not playing the game theory anymore. They're just sort of subsidizing. They're stupid. It actually makes no sense either, right? Because many of the the miners are actually losing money on mining Big Cash. So when you have actors losing money, you have to think, what are they gaining, right? Like no no actor in, in any sort of system plays to lose. That's stupid. So Big Cash makes no sense. I mean, you know, they had an attempt. That attempt made sense, right? I mean, even though I disagree with their reasons or their specs or whatever, the economical theory there or the game theory there, it made sense for them to try to park, right? Because they wanted to have their own system. And they had the hope that the rest of the network was going to follow their fork. But after that, and after a little bit of time, the price reflected their inaptitude at winning that. And then, you know, now it's their hash rate is also reflecting the disinterest in playing that game. So uh, I think now it's just noise, really. It's a fun example, but it's just noise. Yeah, I think it's a good example. I mean, Bitcoin is the ultimate decentralized, no authority system. So there's there's no ruler, just rules, if you will. Um, and that's kind of how they, the network operates. Whereas it seems like with Bcash and some of the other alternative protocol coins, <laughs> which I think it's probably the nicest way to say shitcoin. I, I think what they've tried to do is really have, you know, strong marketing campaigns and an authority figure. Uh, you know, they've got a creator, they've got a founder of the system, and usually there's tons of founder rewards within those coins, even if it's stated that there aren't. They're all scams. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of interesting because like in the early days, it made sense for you to have competing chains just as backup security, right? Because you could say like in those days, Bitcoin was not one secured enough and two decentralized enough. So you could have Bitcoin, say, made illegal in too many places at the same time and people were just too scared and then that's it, right? Like we could just lose Bitcoin. So we would be nice to move to a secondary chain with your value as Bitcoin is dying. But I think now it's the total opposite, right? It makes no sense to, uh, to have these other chains because Bitcoin is so decentralized. I mean, I'm not like naive. I think it's interesting to have other things being tried and played with. And I think it's very possible that something else better than Bitcoin comes along and, and takes its place. But I just don't see anything that, that could take its place right now that is worthy of my time and my, my effort. Like, for example, Ethereum, right? Like, it, it is an interesting idea to want to decentralize issuance of tokens. But, you know, Ethereum technically is crap and it was a very successful means of enriching the founders. But all that reason to exist could be done in, in different ways, in much more efficient ways. So uh, I guess that's like where we're at now. Um, I hope to see more interesting projects that who knows, maybe even compete with Bitcoin. It's just they don't seem to appear. What we see is all sort of people trying to do get rich quick schemes. Yeah, I think if you look at the fundamental intent behind Bitcoin, and I mean, who am I to comment about intent, but it seems like it was created as a, a protest against an unfair system and, you know, a nonviolent protest, a way for people to kind of make their way out into a, a new system. And I, I think that any system that doesn't embrace that initial intent and have the game theory and have the economic incentives, uh, I think it's just destined to fail. Well, fail for who, right? I mean, Ethereum succeeded in making the founders rich. So in that sense, it was a success. <laughs> yep. You know, many scams were a great success in making the founders rich. And you could say the majority of them were. They just, you know, they didn't fail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good way of looking at it. And I think that's what keeps me involved in Bitcoin is the fact that it's something quite different. It's not just the make as much money as you can by scamming others, typical way you see some businesses operating. 
Instead, it's something that's actually adding value. And by people continuing to participate, it continues to have value and share that value without being a, a weak system. For me, it seems that Bitcoin is, is very strong. You know, there's something like, what, 100,000 full nodes globally, where they've got the full replication yep. of the chain. And more and more people are coming online with full nodes. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's pretty cool to have a system that has no morals. Like, it's amoral, right? That's what money should be. Uh, I don't want other people's morals to be sort of forced onto me. So it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, like people do whatever they want on top of it. It's up to them to be what they want to be and have their preferences. And Bitcoin is, is a very powerful system for that kind of freedom. Yeah, it's the ultimate uh, separation of government and, I guess, church and state. That's right. Cool. Speaking about new developments, um, where do you see Bitcoin going next? What's some of the more interesting research you're seeing in the space? Because it's money. And because it's like a, a moving car, it's always going to be sort of incremental as opposed to uh, big changes. It's like move slow and don't break things. You know, Schnorr is pretty cool. It helps a lot with a lot of different stuff. It's going to make, you know, blocks more efficient. It's going to make multi-sig more efficient. There, there's proofs for Schnorr. It's easier calculation on hardware. There's a lot of uh, immediate efficiency gains. And then, you know, if Taproot eventually gets uh, merged in as well, then Schnorr plus Taproot now enables a ton of stuff, especially privacy things, like a lot of powerful types of more complex signature types. Um, what else? Bitcoin Core is improving slowly, now supports harder wallets. There's going to be more UI support for harder wallets as well. You know, th there is a lot of projects that are not core related or protocol related that are very interesting and improving things as well. There is the Square grant that's going to help a lot because it's like granting you now some people working on UI things for Bitcoin. I'm bullish. There's there's a lot of things happening. Yeah, there there really is. What do you think about the... So to go back a little bit, one of the initial points that made Ethereum a little bit different was the smart contracts and the ability to write a smart contract on top of a network. Bitcoin's always had that ability, but now that there is, I guess, more incentive to create... Uh, smart contracts on, you know, side chains and different tokens uh, through side chains. What are your thoughts on those? So there's two separate things happening here. Decentralized exchange of tokens is a cool thing. It's fantastic, right? Being able to say, I want to give you a share of Apple in exchange for this, whatever coffee you gave me, right? Like without any parties having to be part of our exchange of that token share. Right. But the truth remains that like Apple is centralized, right? Any company, any entity is centralized at the end of the day. All these smart contracts are fully centralized. And it's like they have this very sort of like very dishonest marketing about being decentralized because at the end of the day, there is only a few people that can change the code on that contract. And even worse, you can just ask Vitalik to roll back the chain if you want to make a change to it. So yeah, I think it's very important to realize that having decentralized exchange of these tokens is very cool. Claiming these tokens are decentralized themselves is a lie, right? And, and I think once we have this honesty sorted out, a lot more interesting things will come about. And I think a lot of these things are sort of coming onto Liquid Network, which is honest about being federated, not fully decentralized. And the entities starting to issue things on this liquid network are a little bit more honest about their marketing in regards to the centralization of their tokens and who's actually in charge of the entity that issues the tokens. Yeah, that's a really fair point. I think that's maybe where some of the, the other protocols went wrong is they tried to do everything all at once and everything was all just vaporware. I think they rode that hype cycle successfully for a while. And of course, now they're seeing all this regulatory fire come down on them, <laughs> which, you know, rightfully so. Yeah, it's only coming down on them because it is centralized, right? You can't put Satoshi in jail. And even if you could, it doesn't make any difference to Bitcoin. So the proof of a decentralized system is, can you call in the CEO of that project into uh, a congressional hearing or not? If you can't, well, that project is decentralized. Yeah, that's a really good way of, of looking at it. So one thing I did want to touch on is your radio operator's license. And if you can tell our listeners a little bit about that, how you got into it, why you got into it, and how they can learn more if they're interested. So amateur radio is a pretty cool, powerful thing. It's kind of like, you know, how Bitcoin is be your own bank. 
amateur radio is be your own communications. It's one of those uh, hobby or interests. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, you have to do a lot of research. There is no way around that. You know, there is different sort of views on this, but uh, it's a licensed activity for you to transmit in most countries. I kind of wish it wasn't, but, you know, it is. It mostly is because uh, you can cause a lot of grief and damage to infrastructure if you don't have people trained and sort of answerable to their activities. So amateur radio essentially is a catch-all for having multiple types and systems of uh, radio frequency devices that you can sort of transmit and receive, right? So, you know, I have HF radios that I can talk to people in different parts of the world, uh, right from sort of my house with no wire connection or satellites or anything, right? It's just literally the antenna on top of my house talking to somebody has an antenna on top of their house in another part of the world and you can use digital modes to do that so you can use like keyboards and computers you know you can even send bitcoin via radio uh, and, and it's very powerful to be able to send and receive communication uh, without any centralized entity right it's uh is the equivalent of, of Bitcoin in terms of being uncensorable. So much so that there's a lot of illegal stations that broadcast a lot of stuff. Uh, there is a lot of funny, weird ones that, that would broadcast like, you know, like a propaganda about like aliens or some weird religions. There's all kinds of uh, very fortune type things around, around him radio. You know, and there is very pragmatic, practical things. Like, for example, uh, in Toronto, we have there's a bunch of repeaters around the city. We even have a repeater on the CN Tower so that we can use like small little hand, handheld radios all over the city and, you know, in the car and sort of communicate with other peers around that. Uh, you can connect some of those in the internet and then you can sort of like uh, have an in point and out point in different countries for handheld low power devices. Yeah, so I, I mean, I got into that because of uh, curiosity of it. And it's sort of like it's very aligned with Bitcoin in terms of like decentralization of, of information. So it's a very interesting uh, hobby. You learn a lot about uh, physics and science and, you know, it's, it's cool. Awesome. So if people are interested in finding out more, what's the process for that? So it really depends on the country you're in. So most countries will have a few organizations Normally you have like one or two that are the bigger ones in your country and you have the ARRL in the US, you have the RAC in Canada. So these are uh, nonprofit organizations for ham radio operators. I'm not part of any. Uh, I have my own club in Toronto and you sort of have to learn the stuff and then you can do a government test that's often proctored by an amateur radio operator as a, there's examiners that are just either volunteers or they'll charge a small fee and they'll proctor the exam and then uh, once you get approved, you apply for a license and uh, and then you get a call sign. Kind of how like radio stations have those uh, call signs that they often say, uh, WZRL, you know, like uh, FM or whatever. So you get one of those identifiers for your station and uh, and then you can operate. What would be the, the time commitment and sort of cost involved? Is there a cost involved? So time commitment is really is from very little to a lot. There is people who really get into this stuff. Uh, and there is people who just have, you know, like a little handheld that they like to play with. There's people who just like to listen. There is, uh, you can even track airplanes. It's kind of cool. Like you can track airplanes. You can listen to airplanes. There's people who are into that. There's people who are into carrying very low power devices and, and trying to do very far communication with the least amount of power. There is sort of like a, a rabbit hole for for any type of curiosity in this in ham radio. In terms of money, it really is what kind of equipment you're into. Uh, it could be just, you know, a few dollars for used radio. It could be hundreds of thousands of dollars in expensive, very powerful, complicated equipment. And then there is the knowledge, right? I mean, the, the initial knowledge, there is a bit of a learning curve there, uh, especially for you to do your license. So, yeah, I think like if you just study for a few weeks, you should be able to pass the exam. And then, uh, and then from there, you just sort of deepen your knowledge in whatever field of it you're interested. One thing that you're a big proponent of is carnivory. Um, and I know when I was in Toronto last time, uh, you and Peter took me to Barbarians, which is probably one of the nicest steak restaurants I've ever been to. Uh, it was, you know, simple decor, excellent service, and most importantly, high, high quality uh, meat, really. So what got you into carnivory and why is it something that's important to you? So I'm a, more of an omnivore. <laughs> But uh, I'm a big proponent of eating a lot of meat. Uh, I've experimented with different diets. Uh, 
I was fortunate that in the Bitcoin space, there is a lot of uh, people who, who put in a lot of time and effort into diet research. And I don't know, I, I, I sort of started playing around with uh, eating meat. And uh, I think I've sort of right now settled on a mostly meat and leafy greens vegetable diet. Uh, <laughs> with some with some chocolate, uh, sugarless chocolate and uh, red wine. That's most of uh, what I eat. And uh, I don't know, it, it's fascinating how well you feel once you go in ketosis, right? Like once you're keto and eating mostly meat or mostly animal protein, right? So like eggs and, and cheese and stuff. It's fascinating how much easier it is for you to live that diet. And, you know, I grew up in Brazil, so... Uh, meat barbecue was, was <laughs> embedded in me as a child so it wasn't too hard or or too weird for me to sort of eat mostly meat um yeah it's just it feels good i'm a big fan of uh if it feels good it's probably good for you nice a couple more questions and then then we'll close out this is a big one though and one that uh, you seem to be a very big proponent of why is privacy important well, I mean, without privacy, you go to jail. It's uh, it's like privacy is is the enabler of freedom, right? Because something that is allowed today may not be allowed tomorrow. So when you have privacy, you're free to one, fight that injustice because the people who commit that injustice may not want you to fight that injustice. So you, you need to be able to not be taken down if you are in that pursuit. Uh, two, I mean, it, you know, it, it's like a, a natural human right. You're entitled to your private thoughts. Uh, you should be entitled to your private communication. Uh, you should be entitled to share your thoughts with only the people you want them to hear. And it really goes along with, uh, it's a sort of like privacy is the best, it's one of the best, most important tools to enable uh, freedom of speech uh, and all the forms of freedom of speech, including freedom of association and freedom of commerce. People should be allowed to do whatever they want as long as they don't hurt other people. That's a really good way to put it and a really great way to end this conversation. One final question. Do you have any questions for our audience? And if so, how can they reach you? So if you want to find me, one good way is at NVK on, uh, on Twitter or uh, on Telegram. We have a cold card Telegram group. Those are very easy ways of finding me. If you want to find me for radio stuff, you can uh, reach the VHF Toronto Tower and look for uh, VA3TOX. And, uh, you know, you can find me on the internet. It's not too hard. Awesome. All right, Rodolfo, thanks so much for joining me today. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, stay safe and stay sane during the pandemic. It sounds like you're doing all the right things. Uh, hopefully it's over soon. Um, but yeah, I appreciate your time. Oh, thanks for having me. 